They figured it was economically more advantageous to ship new folks in than to keep them alive and have them birth children. I won't go into the gory details, there are children in this room, but it was, it was really rough. And, and folks decided, like, liberty of death, essentially. The Seal Fatima organized people to come to a ceremony. There were many languages in the room, in the space, right? There were many uh, religions, many cultures, because folks came from 26 different language groups across Africa to Haiti, and managed to unite them in prayer and in preparation for a war that would eventually overthrow you know, the most powerful army in the world at the time, the French, Napoleon's army, and establish the first free black republic and the first nation to outlaw slavery. So I'm calling Cecile Fatima into the room because we as African heritage folks, we always honor our ancestors before we do anything. So I want you to think of an ancestor you want to honor right now, because all of us are here because of somebody's sacrifice. And I'm going to count to three and say their name like you need it. One, two, three. Thank you. I also want to honor um, the first peoples of this land. You know, farmers who depend on land can't grow any food without it. And personally, our, hand, our land is uh, Stockbridge Munsee Mohican land. And folks who were with me earlier, I was explaining this really deep land sharing project we have going on. Uh, with the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican, which is essential for us. Um, even though many of us have black ancestry, indigenous ancestry, it doesn't mean we came from this particular place. Right? So I'm curious um, whose land y'all are on. You're all from different places in Virginia. Can anyone let me know? Algonquin, Pahatan. So if you don't know, that's very important to find out, and not just to find out, but to figure out how to support whatever the indigenous folks who rightfully have stewardship on the land are trying to do. Whether it's fighting a pipeline, that would be very important to support. Or whether it's getting their land back, right, that would be very important to support. So make sure that we're taking the lead and being in solidarity with indigenous sovereignty no matter where we are. And my final shout out goes to my team. Because you can't farm alone, so I want to give some love to my partner Jonah, our children that she's eminent, a wonderful farm team, Larissa, Demaris, Letitia, and so on. We're a squad. There we go. Um, let's talk about a little bit of history. Because I assume that we're all in this room because we deeply care about the earth, we deeply care about community, and we really want to see the farming and food system be just and sustainable and equitable and inclusive. We're not interested in a Monsanto run farming and food system, right? We're not interested in continuing a pattern of colonization and capitalism and exploitation. We really want to be able to feed ourselves in a way that's fair and doesn't cause harm. But unfortunately, oftentimes, even in very progressive communities, we leave out a whole section of the population. Like we leave out the people who grow 85% of the food in this country. Who grows 85% of the food in this country? Exactly. People who identify as Hispanic or Latino and who are born outside of the so-called borders of the United States. Who, like, the USDA can't even call farmers, right? The laborers are farm workers, even though they probably have more expertise than a lot of the owners of farmers that they work for. So let's talk a little bit about kind of how this came to be, this erasure, this oppression, and what we can do about it. This beautiful painting uh, my sister did uh, for my book, it's called Foresight. And it's called Foresight because it speaks to the incredible foresight that our African grandmothers had in the 1600s, 1700s, when all these folks were getting rounded up and kidnapped in their communities. All their best farmers getting rounded up and kidnapped and taken who knew where. There was like no report back. You know, I, I lived for some time in down in West Africa and I asked people like, what was it like on this side? You know? And they said, well, nobody came back to tell us. And so there were all kinds of rumors, like maybe people fell off the edge of the earth, maybe they were eating people. I mean, you really didn't know. So you imagine with that sort of terror, that sort of question, making the decision they made, which was to gather up the seeds that they had saved for generations. The black rice, the geranium, the palm, the kale, the melon seeds, and they hid it in their hair. So if you part your hair, you can put seeds along the part, and then you can braid it over. And so that is the way, <laughs> that is the way that our ancestors showed us that they believed we would exist. 
And it wasn't just all these amazing seeds and crowds that they, they brought over, right? As we talked about earlier today, those were in my workshop. There's incredible sustainable ag technologies that came as well. So a lot of things we take for granted as ahistorical or European, or we just use them and don't think about them. Things like texture by feel, soil testing, vermicomposting, um, terraces, raised beds, cover cropping, work parties, credit unions, food preservation, right, the hoe. All of these technologies came from black agriculturalists through the Middle Passage. But the project of the empire, right, the project of settler colonialism is not just to take a bunch of stuff, it's also to try to make us forget who we, who we really are. And so my project, and we'll get to the happy part soon, but my project is really that of remembering, of like calling back and honoring that technology. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at what happens to try to make us forget, right? Does anyone know this picture? Recognize this? Yep. Yes. Manifest destiny. So this is an 1800s picture. This idea actually started back in the 1400s, 1455 to be specific. Pope Nicholas, Catholic Church, put out this humble bull. It's like a, the law. You know, it said essentially, white Christian nations, you have the authority of the church to go forth, enslave, colonize, and pillage non-Christian nations. It was the beginning of the age of exploration, discovery, you know, Jesus Santa Maria, all that kind of stuff. Like came out of that. But it wasn't just the Catholic Church. That became the basis of U.S. law. Has anyone ever turned, heard the term finders keepers? What comes after that? Great. Uh, so this came out in 1823, Supreme Court case, which established in U.S. law the doctrine of discovery. If a white person finds land and brown people are on it, it's the white person's land. Sorry. And this is not old history, and I'm not being like a sensationalist. Like, look up Doctrine of Discovery on Wikipedia. This is a lie. In 2005 is the most recent time the Supreme Court upheld Doctrine of Discovery. The Oneida Nation in New York sued to get some of their ancestral territories back, some of their unceded territories. And the Supreme Court said, sorry, finders, keepers, Doctrine of Discovery, because Native folks are domestic dependent nations without sovereign rights to their lands. You lost it on colonization. So we've never rectified that. You never fixed it. There was no reparations, and even still, the land is being stolen. So the, the DNA, right, of the food system is stolen land and stolen labor. Twelve and a half million expert agriculturalists who knew how to do tropical and subtropical agriculture, and the Europeans didn't, right, were taken to establish the rice of the Carolinas, right, and sugar of the Caribbean. And we would think, like, that's ancient history in a lot of ways, because 1865, what happened? Emancipation Proclamation, 13th Amendment, right? So we should be good. But unfortunately, the U.S. had never decided to mutate its own DNA out of the stolen land, exploited labor situation. So in 1865, a loophole was put in the 13th Amendment, right? Slavery is outlawed except in the case of if you're convicted of a crime. If you're convicted of a crime, slavery is legal. Look it up, 13th Amendment. Again, not exaggerated, that's exactly the wording. And so, the South created the Black Codes, which are a series of laws that criminalize blackness. You see loitering and vagrancy on the books for the first time all across the South. That means hanging around or not having a job. You're rounded up, you put back into prison, and you're leased at the benefit of the state's coffers to the plantation, the mines, and the railroads. This was not a side note in history. 73% of Alabama's state budget from 1866 to 1869 came from leasing African American people back to the plantation. This is significant. And even today, we still have penal farms. Like, who put out those fires in California? Right? People in orange suits, right? So that's still legal to be underpaid or unpaid if you've been convicted of a crime. It also was the beginning of uh, sort of the proto-social service agency because if your parents, if black parents were not industrious and honest, children would be taken away and apprenticed to their former masters. So it was also the beginning of what we now call the social service agency. Right, so most black folks as farmers uh, were sharecro sharecroppers or tenant farmers. That's a debt peonage system where you often end up in more debt at the end of the season than the beginning because you don't actually own the means of production. Um, and you can't leave because you're under contract. And what's incredible to me, 
you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, even facing these, these really onerous, really tough situations, you know, my ancestors uh, by 1910 had purchased 15 and a half million acres of land out of their own pocket. Like 40 acres and a mule was a cool idea that actually came out of um, Reverend Frazier and 30 uh, black ministers got together with the Union Army, uh, General Sherman, and said, you know what we really need is we need land, we need to be able to own our own farms. He was like, cool, we'll take some land from the you know, rebels in the South that will give us you. But Andrew Jackson reversed that policy. So that land was never given. There was no free land. There was no 40 acres and a mule. Um, but people didn't purchase land. 14% of the nation's farmland, in fact, which was roughly proportional to the amount of black folks in the country. It's incredible. But this was so threatening and so disruptive to the system, uh, particularly in the South, that there was a backlash. So you see the rise of white supremacist terrorism after Reconstruction. Um, 4,500 people were lynched in the community. The majority of those people were attempting to own land or were owning land because they weren't staying in their place. And that's a lot of people, but I'm going to read you one tiny testimony of one person just to give a sense of what it was actually like to try to be a black farmer in the South at this time. So this is um, October 4th, 1908. Uh, Fifty hooded white men surrounded the home of a black farmer in Hinkman, Kentucky after midnight and ordered him to come out for a whipping. When David Walker refused and shot at them instead, the mob poured coal oil on his house and set it afire, according to contemporary newspaper accounts. Pleading for mercy, Walker ran out the front door, followed by four screaming children and his wife carrying a baby in her arms. The mob shot them all, wounding three children and killing the others. Walker's oldest son never escaped the burning house. No one was ever charged with the killings, and the surviving children were deprived of the farm their father died defending. Land records show that Walker's farm was simply folded into the property of a white neighbor. The neighbor sold it to another man whose daughter owns the undeveloped lands today in 2017. Mm. So this came from last year an Associated Press investigation uh, that, that did 406 case studies like this that amounted to 24,000 acres of land. Um, so the Great Migration, you all know what that is? Six million black people go north. And so I had kind of been taught about the Great Migration from the perspective of like there's jobs in the, in the north, um, there's jobs in the city, people are going to work in the factories during the war, which is partly true, part of the Renaissance, all of that. But there was a, a refugee crisis. People were fleeing the terrorism in the South, mm -hmm. and then trying to escape that to the paved streets of the urban war. And so there was a labor battle. And this was an opportunity for the United States to kind of reckon with its history and say, you know, maybe we need to rethink how we're doing farm labor in this country, rethink how we're doing agriculture in this country. But instead of doing that, it looked for a new population to exploit. Any idea who would think? Exactly. So starting, it was really the late 1800s with the Asian community, but starting in earnest, 1930-1940, um, the Bracero program, bringing in Mexican migrant workers. And around the same time was a huge renaissance for workers. We had the New Deal, right, which provided Social Security. It provided um, a limit to the working day, overtime payments, the, the right to unionize, child labor protections. This was a very important time in history for the worker. But the Democrats in the South, and at the time, was you know, uh, but they wouldn't vote for the law. FDR tried to include everyone, but they wouldn't pass this package unless it excluded black and brown people. Now, they couldn't put excluded black and brown people in the law, so what they did is just excluded agricultural workers and domestic workers, who were the people of color in the community. And to this day, if you read the National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act, there's still an exclusionary clause for farm workers and domestic workers, which is why if you're a farm worker in this country and you work on a farm with less than seven people, you're not even entitled to a minimum wage. You are not entitled to a minimum wage if you are a farm worker on a small farm in this country. Your state might have different laws, but federally you are not. What's that? I just thought we took a pay cut. So, 
And here are the people who grow, you know, 85% of the food in this country. Don't have the right to unionize, child labor protections are lacking, and so on. Of course, we don't. It wasn't only racial terrorism that led to the decline of the black farmer. You know, now only about 1% of farmers are black. Farming and being a veterinarian or being a farmer, farm manager, they alternate between being the whitest professions in the United States. They go back and forth pretty much every year. Right? The second reason was federal government discrimination. Right? So USDA has programs. We all know about this program. Right? Commodity programs, it's credit, technical assistance, etc. Crop allotments. Well, because a lot of it's controlled at the county level, if there's discrimination in your community, there's going to be discrimination in the allocation of resources. And this was happening for decades throughout. And so there'd be a drought. Farmer Joe, who's chummy with you know the agent, would, would get the loan for the irrigation. Black farmer down the road, I'm sorry, we can't find your application. Right? So this was happening decade after decade. But during the Civil Rights Movement, it got really tricky because these programs became, as Pete Daniel would say, sharpened into weapons to punish civil rights activity. So if you were found out to try to register to vote or to sign up for the NAACP, you could be damn sure that you were not going to get any of those resources to which you were entitled. The farmers uh, filed a class action lawsuit against the federal government. It was settled in 1999, the Pinkford v. Blitzen case. It is the largest civil rights settlement in the history of this country, a $2 billion settlement that was paid. $50,000 each farmer, so if you're a farmer, you know that that's not going to get you very far. But it was an important symbolic victory because it interrupted the narrative that the black people just don't want to farm. You know, it's just their personal problem as opposed to a historical event. And of course, you know, in the North, it wasn't that different. People really hoped for it to be different. But our aspiration is always to own land, to own our own homes, to be able to pass on wealth to our children. And because of federal housing discrimination, also started in the 1930s, you get to the north and people were concentrated in these neighborhoods. A system called redlining, where essentially, literally, banks drew red lines on the map around communities of color and said no lending there. Right? It also created these restrictive covenants in people's deeds to make sure that inharmonious racial groups did not mix. It's why we have food deserts or food apartheid, whole neighborhoods without grocery stores. It's why we have de facto segregation in our schools. It comes back to this housing model beyond the scope of this talk that we can talk after. It's why this amazing young person is relying on an emergency food system to get her food, and why she's more likely than a white child to die of diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and to suffer from poor eyesight, depression, ADHD, and other diet-related illness. Because it's not because her family doesn't know how to cook or they don't want to or are not motivated. It's because quite literally in many of our neighborhoods in the urban north, you can get hot chicos and takis and all that kind of stuff, but you cannot get anything fresh, anything nourishing. You know, I have a master's degree and I know how to farm. And I was living in the south of Albany, a food apartheid neighborhood. And I, the only way to get food on the table for my children was to join a CSA, Community Support Agriculture, that cost more than my rent and to walk 2.2 miles to the pickup site, put the vegetables on my child in the stroller, and walk back to our apartment. That was the closest fresh food. So you imagine what it's like for someone who doesn't know how to navigate all that, that system. I talked about farm workers. I talked about, you know, right now, according to the last USDA since 2012, 98% of the farmland, and 99% of the farmland value is owned by white folks in this country. Not fair. And by the way, we're destroying the planet. We all know about that. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we at Soul Fire are doing and what other folks in the food sovereignty and food justice movement are doing to correct this because there's a way we can all really be involved and heal. Um, but I want to give you a moment just to, to break up the narrative, to talk to each other at your table about this question. Okay. Give you like two or three minutes. Um, where were your ancestors in this history, and how are your people connected to these past events? And I don't know if you can answer, but take a couple minutes and talk, and then we'll get to the good news. <laughs>
is a farm. Which sounds obvious to y'all, but it's incredible how much social justice activism these days is based on ideas only. And I don't get that. I was like, wait, what do you do? I tweet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. So we grow food, actual food, um, vegetables, meat, eggs, you know, herbs, fruits. We box it up um, and we bring it to those who need it most in our communities through a, a distribution pro program. Uh, we affectionately term Netflix for vegetables. <laughs> so people get their doorstep delivery of their box. Um, 350 folks, it's all hyper-local, and people pay what they can afford on a sliding scale. So some folks pay more, some folks pay less, and some folks get a totally free box. Um, that's our program for refugees, which we call Solidarity Shares, and a neighbor sponsors the box for them as a way of welcoming them to the community. It's been a very powerful program. And actually came out of partnership we had with a local health clinic because um, a doctor there was on our board, and she's like, in my patients who come to the United States, She's like, within three months, their diet's westernized, their cholesterol goes up, their blood pressure, all these things, because they're moving into these neighborhoods with no cultural food. And she's like, if we can get those foods to folks from jump, like right from when they get here, it's gonna change the whole course of the family's health. And I was like, we're in, let's figure it out. So, so we connect with families with the clinic, we get a neighbor to sponsor and welcome them, and, and the farmer still gets paid, which is very important, um, and, the, and the family gets their free box. Pretty picture of the vegetables. Um, but what's important to remember is just as we went through this whole history of like oppression and all this pain in the food system, is there was resistance and remembrance at every stage. So all these things we're doing now at Soul Fire and our networks, we didn't make them up, right? Who's that? For him. Yeah, the Black Panthers. So they're they're known for um, armed self-defense, which certainly happened, but almost all their time and resource went to survival programs. They fed 20,000 children a day in Oakland. They had transportation for elders, transporta transportation for people to visit their loved ones in prison, you know, clinics, grocery distribution, all of these things. And so when we talk about feeding ourselves in our community, we're very much on the back of the work of the Black Panthers. The federal government took notice of the impact of free breakfast on children's learning, and now we have the free breakfast program. We grow food in a way that doesn't trash the planet, like y'all, you know? Carbon, back into the soil, where it belongs. Pollinators, call back into the landscape where they belong. You know, when we first got to our land, it was so degraded uh, from erosion, overgrazing, logging, that you could stick your hand in the topsoil and touch the heart of man. Like, that was how thin the soil was work. Um, our veggies are great, everyone was like, you can't farm there. But, but we built the soil over time. Using ancestral crops and methods. You know, heavy mulching and terracing and raised beds and cover crops and so on. But perhaps even more important than all of these material techniques are the spiritual techniques. Raise your hand if you think the earth is dead. Cool. Right. She's not. The earth is an alive living system. And many of us believe, certainly African cosmology, indigenous cosmology, we believe that the earth isn't just alive, but is conscious and is in a mutuality with us, is in a reciprocity with us. There's a give and take, there's a consent. Uh, so I know I told the story earlier, but it's one of my favorites. Is, um, I was studying farming in Ghana with the Queen Mothers, so they're like the OGs of community organizing. And they like to ask me questions about what life is really like in the United States. Like daily. I'm even with my name. We have a question for you, you know? And they were like, is it true that in the United States, the farmer will put the seed in the ground and they will pour no libation. They will not pray. They will not sing. They will not dance. They won't even say thank you and they expect the seed to grow. I was ashamed. It's true. I might have even done that. <laughs> They're like, no wonder y'all are sick. <laughs> because we can't sustain ourselves like that, treating the earth as a so here we are, you know, we just planted some stuff, we're dancing and singing and doing the whole thing. Our veggies are really good. Okay? <laughs> try it. Try gratitude. <laughs> but we didn't make up regenerative farming, right? It wasn't just the techniques and technologies that came across the Middle Passage. There's been a lot of innovation in the black community since. Right? Anyone recognize those two innovators? 
Carver and Wally. Yeah, Carver was really into the peanut. That's usually all that people know. But the peanut, the reason you're going to the peanut is the legume, and legumes are nitrogen fixers, right? In collaboration with rhizobial bacteria, they heal the soil. So he was really the grandfather of organic agriculture. A whole generation before Rodale, he was teaching at Tuskegee University how to use cover crops, composting, heavy mulching, diversified water culture, livestock foraging, all of these things he was teaching to his students. He even created a movable schoolhouse before extension to go out to farmers and teach them these techniques because he said not everyone can come to the university. Right? Watley was a generation after him and he was noticing that black farmers weren't making any money on row crops. And so he said, we need to completely rethink this whole thing. And folks thought he was nuts. He's like, I have this idea. You get it? All right, we're going to take city folks. We're going to bring them out to the farm. They are going to harvest. And I'm going to call it Pick Your Own. <laughs> are you kidding? But it worked, right? He had something called the Clientel Membership Club. So you're a disconnected city person. You could join for a fee. You get these wholesale prices. You feel connected to the farmer. There's a newsletter, right? And so now, I don't know about how it's done here, but up in the Northeast, like almost every farm is trying to do some kind of CSA pick your own situation. So really change the way we market and think about our crops. So the second thing we're doing of three um, is educating. And this really came out of, you know, we didn't plan to be an educational farm per se, um, but I started getting a lot of phone calls from aspiring black farmers, particularly being like, I can't find a training program, I can't get into an incubator program, I'm running up against discrimination, I'm running up against isolation, can you do something to like help us get in the game? And I didn't, I didn't even think black folks wanted a farm, but I was still in that mindset. So I was like, oh sure, I'll create a program. I'll create like a week-long training. It'll be a 101. We'll go through everything from crop selection. You know, just the basics. I posted on Facebook. I know that's not in anymore. But I'm not on Snapchat or whatever. I posted on Facebook. It filled up in 24 hours with 20 students. So I was like, oh, I'll make another session. That one filled up in six hours. We have a wait list two years long. We have trained 600 new black farmers on our little friends.
They're like, just give us a chance to show you how it can be done. And so this young person who had stolen the phone didn't come back to the program the next day. He was ashamed. But he and my son had hit it off really beautifully. And they had promised, Ben, the older boy, had promised my son, who was like seven or eight at the time, they were going to make bow and arrows together and like target practice in the woods the next time. But he didn't show up. So my son's like totally betrayed. He's like, he told me that I was like his little brother and he was going to come and he didn't come. And so I convinced the, the suits to give us the cell phone number of this kid. So my son calls him in tears like, you promised. And then he didn't come. He came back. <laughs>
is to make sure that when, whenever we're talking about an issue like racism that impacts a certain group of people, right, or anti-Semitism that impacts a certain group of people, it's a no-brainer to take the lead of those impacted people in terms of what we should do, right? I'm not a veteran. I am not going to pretend to go into a community of veterans and tell them what they need and to try to take charge. That would just be nuts, right? And so it would not make any sense, right, as a white person to go into a community of color and say, you know what y'all need? You need these cooking classes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> y'all laughing because you know this happens all the time. Okay? So it's very, very important to take the lead of the impact of community. And that might mean, like, if you go and you're, the black church is organizing something and you go and they might say, oh, we don't need your help or we just need money or we need childcare. And that's a perfectly good way to contribute. Right? Perfectly good. Self-education is really important, too. Um, it helps a lot because it can be tiresome, you know, if you're in an impacted community, you always have to be explaining everything, so self-education is all out there these days, it's awesome. Um, and the great thing is that, you know, communities of color who are impacted by racism in the food system have put together what our needs are. We need fully funded SNAP. We need an end to junk food marketing. We need a reform of the H-2A law. We need more funding for 2501. We need air property protection, all of these things, right? And so I've been gathering some of the different platforms together on our Take Action page at Soulfire, so if you're interested in looking and learning and being like, oh, I could talk to my senator about that, you know, type of thing, that's very, very helpful. And of course, reparations, right? It's like giving back to folks from whom things were stolen. So if you do have land, if you do have resources, really think about um, the fact that, you know, 80% of wealth is inherited in this country. The wealth gap right now between white folks and black folks is 16 to 1. And the main way that intergenerational wealth is transferred is through property. If you add those three facts together, most likely some of the land that many of us hold needs to be shared. And here's just a few of the organizations that are doing the work that are led by black and brown people. There's hundreds more. Again, those are all listed on our website. So you can reach out and get involved and support. Some faces to the names. Mama Karen, Baba Malik, and it's Derek. These are just some of the, the food movement leaders right now. So I'm gonna end with a poem, and I need a friend to help me read it. And I pick you to run. Come on. Get up there. <laughs> I know you're all the way back there, but you're my new friend. <laughs> so the way it's going to go um, is I read a line or like a little chunk and then you read a line or a little chunk and so on. Yeah, yeah, come on. It's more fun if I can pull. See? See what you can do. Never mind, you can't tell one letter from another. Never mind, you're born a slave. Never mind, you lose your name. Never mind, your daddy dead. Never mind, nothing. Here, this here, is what a man can do if he puts his mind to it and his back in it. Stop sniveling, the land said. Stop picking around the edges of the world. Take advantage, and if you can't take advantage, take disadvantage. We live here, on this planet, in this nation, in this country right here, nowhere else. I got a home in this, Rob, don't you see? Nobody's starving in my home. Nobody crying in my home. And if I got a home, you got one too. Grab it. Grab this land. Take it. Hold it. My brothers, make it. My sisters, shake it. Squeeze it. Turn it. Twist it. Beat it. Kick it. Kiss it. Whip it. Stomp it. Dig it. Plow it. Seed it. Reap it. Rent it. Buy it. Sell it. Own it. Build it. Multiply it and pass it on. Can you hear me? Pass, pass it on. on. <laughs> <laughs>